uh, because this presentation does not long run as long as some of the other ones I've done. So, plenty of time for questions, I hope, and maybe I can even answer them. I'll put this in the body of knowledge. <laughs> Next, I'm going to explain to Ron Wheeler what blockchain is. <laughs> Are you on the volume knowledge committee? Yes, I am, and so is one other person here. <laughs> Without a name. <laughs> we at CPE have been eagerly awaiting your activities. Yes, yeah, so have we. We hope it lives up to your expectations. <laughs> I'm sure it will. It will. I think Two more minutes. Normally I'd start on time, but I know there's some other people coming up. Or at least I will give another minute for everyone to walk in. If I don't see anyone walk in, we'll get started. I think I must have CC'd you uh, everyone do, that does have technology, please open it up. Uh, part of this is interactive. You will be asked to do Cali Instapol because this is Cali, and I asked Deb what I should use, and she said Instapol. That's a not surprising answer from them. All right, and all right. I think this is a big enough audience. Can I get started? Yes. yes. All right, blockchain, it's so hot uh, right now. How hot is it? Oh. 105 degrees. <laughs> been waiting all week to do that one. <laughs> so, uh, blockchain, yeah, it's a tad bit complicated. When I do presentations for this conference or other conferences, I either do one of two things. Either A, I pick something that they say we're doing at Chicago Kent, and Dawn in the back will usually know all about it, and then I say this is all the great stuff we've done and what we might do later and what's working and what's not, or I pick a subject I know absolutely nothing about, and I do research in it so I can explain it to you guys and explain why I think it's important. This year I picked number two. So blockchain is relatively new to me, but I wanted to see what I could learn about it because I saw that it was becoming increasingly important for lots of different kinds of sectors, including the legal sector. So in this, com uh, in this conference or in this presentation, I will talk about the basics, how it's being used in different uh, industries, and um, uh, particularly focusing on law, education, and libraries. We will be using Instapol, so please go to the Cali Instapol site, and the poll number is 4155. So the first thing I want to know is, are you at the poll? A, yes. B, no. Let's see what it if this works the way I intended to. <laughs> hey, so, all right, none of you are at the poll, but I think we're good. Good. And now I can clear the results. Don't answer the poll now. We've got another poll coming up as soon as I learn how to use this. All right, it's the poll 4155. It's here too. So I want to know from you, what do you already know about blockchain? Have you, A, never heard it before, it's brand new to you. You've heard of it, but you just know some of the basics. That's B. You're actually kind of an expert. Great, you can help me. Or C, you build your own blockchains, which means you can really help me. So I'll give you a couple seconds to answer. You are going to go to cali.org uh, instapol4155 and to see what that looks like. You can tell I use a Mac all the time. Um, now I'm struggling to use a PC. So www.cali.org slash instapoll. When it asks you what poll, go 4155. A, you don't know about it. B, you know the basics. C, you're kind of expert. D, you build your own blockchains. Give me another 30 seconds to answer. All right. So, looks like a couple of you haven't heard it before. That's fine. That's what we're here for. We're going to introduce you to the basics. Uh, to the awesome. Oh, yes, one person who is uh, somewhat of an expert. Good. Uh, who is that person? I'm not going to say. You're not going to say? Okay. <laughs> Good. And they, like, talk to you. No one who's admitting to build their own blockchains. Great. So, hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you have a little bit better idea of what blockchains are and what they mean for uh, legal, library, and other technologies. So, what you may have seen about blockchain is a lot of hype. Who's seen the hype around blockchain so far? So, so much hype. As everyone's getting a blockchain, sure, why not? Um, it's the next iteration of the internet. It's web 3.0 or 4.0 or 5.0. I've lost track. What point oh are we on now? We'll go with 
four, why not? Um, it's going to provide nearly perfect security. It's going to secure all the things. This is terrific. Uh, it's going to revolutionize banking because billions of people are going to have access to tools they've never had access before. And it's even going to revolutionize legal technology and the legal industry with smart contracts. It's going to do all of this stuff. Is anyone buying into this? Anyone not buying into it? Not. Not? Who's a not? I'm a not. Why are you not? Um, so it takes a long time for people to figure out how a new technology is actually really going to impact what they're doing. So I don't think this one is there yet. I don't think it's there yet, and I think that's part of the, but, the, but it's coming, and I'll show you some reasons why. Is anyone thinking, yeah, it's here now, and, we, and it's going someplace really fast? Or is anyone, everyone thinks, we're not sure where it's going, it's going really slowly. Let's find out. So I'm going to start out with what is blockchain, and that's sort of hard to break down, and it's difficult to explain because there are a lot of different people who have different understandings about what it is. So I'm going with what seems to be the consensus way and the best way I've found to explain it so far. And I'm going to use a comic, which you will see in um, a AAAFL spectrum later. So first I go to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia helpfully says it's a distributed database that is used to maintain a continuously growing list of records called blocks. Each block contains a timestamp and a link to a previous block. And a blockchain is typically managed by a peer-to-peer -peer network collectively adhering to protocol for validating new blocks. Thank you, Wikipedia. Sometimes you're less than helpful. Let's try with a little something more simple explanation. So it secures information so that everyone can see it's valid on change. That's one thing the blockchain does. It's a way of preserving and securing information uh, in a democratic way. Let's get to some of the details about how this works. The basic concept isn't new. Has anyone seen an old style contract which seems to sort of have ripples at the top? Why, why do they have that? were two parts so that each party could have um, a part. You just could, the contract is duplicated. On both. Yep. So it was a way to establish back before we had any kind of electronic technology the validity of contracts. The contracts would have seals, but it would also be ripped apart. So they come back with a house later. If they matched, great. And if they didn't, maybe there was a problem. And so we're using a technology that's sort of based on some of these same ideas. Our, is information matching? And we get the same idea behind Bitcoin. I assume, is anyone here who hasn't heard of Bitcoin? I assume most of you have heard of it by now. But uh, for some reasons that have gotten trouble, if you don't know it, it's some sort of online currency, and we'll talk about it in a little more detail in a minute. Um, and behind the, the uh, technology of Bitcoin is a blockchain. And this allows the sender and receiver to know the transaction, uh, happen. It provides a financial transaction. I have some Bitcoin. I give it to you. We look at the blockchain. We see, yep, that happened. Uh, it kept track of it. And we can see the currency has been transferred. And uh, we can see that the, that the transfer was valid. Great. How? Blockchain works on three basic ideas. There's a block. That stores the information. There's the chain. That makes the connection between all this information so we can create this chain. And it's decentralized, or some people might say nodes. This is one way to explain a blockchain. Other people might take a different approach, but this seems to work uh, for getting the basics across. And it provides security, or is one of the things that provides security. But for the purposes of the discussion, a lot of the security comes from how it's decentralized. But what do each of these things mean? Let's take a look. So the block and store information. There is a video I will be posting at the end of, my, um, at the, end of the day, I hope a link to some of the resources I used, and one of the things is a video that explains this block can hold all kinds of information up to including, they say, the entire Library of Congress. Why the whole Library of Congress? I don't know, but it could. Um, and you can store it anywhere. You can encrypt the information um, that's in there. So, for example, again, if you and I are selling Bitcoin, that information will be encrypted. I have a private key to my Bitcoin account. You don't have it. So, you can see there's a block out there, but you can't see what's in it. But the information is there. So what about the chain? The chain connects one block to another. How? It uses something called a hash. Whatever that data is I put into the block, I can use an encryption algorithm, meaning I, I recode it. 
into what we call hex hexadecimal. So that's those numbers that you might see when you're entering in a code to access someone's router. And it's got, uh, the, it's got 16 characters total and includes A, B, C. So it translates it into that. That's because you can translate a lot of information into a fairly short hexadecimal string, and it's unique. So it translates into this string, this hexadecimal string called a hash. Then each block includes the hash of the previous block and usually a timestamp. So I will transfer my Bitcoin to you. That might create a new block. Uh, that creates a unique hash for the new block. You then might buy the next Bitcoin, and that would include the hash from the previous block. And we'll see an example of what that looks like in real life in a second. So block information, chain, a hash that connects one block to another. So now we're going to take a look. This is an example of a blockchain, and it's just a simplistic example. And I just use parts of the Constitution. The first block has the preamble, and I told the blockchain, make a hash that I can put in the next part of the blockchain. And it did. It made this hash 0007D something, something, something. That's then included in the next part of the blockchain. Then I said, OK, here's Article 1, Section 1. Make a hash for that to encode in the second, third part of the blockchain. So this hash becomes part of the data for that blockchain. So it's the for section one plus that hash code. Then this section includes the uh, hash code of the previous set. So this section takes that hash code, includes there, and creates a new hash. So all of these hashes start to link one after another. And you can see each block contains the hash of the previous block. And that's one way we can check for validity of the blockchain is do we see these matching hashes. More than that, the hashes generally start with some kind of pattern. In this case, the hashes start with 0, 0, 0, 0 four zeros. So I can see uh, not only are these connected, but they're connected in a valid way. So I know that each block legitimately is connected to the last block and the information has not been altered from one block to another. And that provides part of the security. So this is what a typical blockchain hash might look like and a typical blockchain pattern might look like. And I'll show you later where you can play with this yourself. If there's a problem, let's say I've changed section one to section one, 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 one. Now I've altered the data. By altering the data, I've changed the hash because each block is, the hash is created by the data in the hash itself. Any change to the data in the um, block changes the hash number. So this hash number one has changed and two no longer meets the pattern. So if I was looking at this blockchain, I could say, oh, there's a problem with the blockchain. Something's messed with it. Something's gone wrong because this number has changed and it no longer matches my pattern. So that's one way that people see that things have gone wrong in a blockchain is they see that the hash number has changed and it doesn't match. One other thing that's done to keep the blockchain safe is the blocks are decentralized. So I might have a block of the information, and you might have a block of the information, and you might have a block of the information, and you might have a block of the information. And there's no single point that anyone can get to the entire chain. It's all over the place. There's no single point of access, which helps to keep it safe. One other thing that people do to help keep it even safer, I don't think this will surprise you guys, is people also, uh, for smaller blockchains, will uh, distribute copies of those chains so that you might have one copy, and you might have a copy, and you might have a copy. And if your three copies agree with one another, you know that you have good information. So you see there's an element when dealing with blockchain of this sort of democ uh, democracy. Um, so that there's no central authority for these blockchains. Uh, when I'm talking about blockchains in general, we'll talk about some exceptions in a little bit. But it's... If you and you and you all agree, this is good, our blockchains are good, then the blockchains are good. But let's say something goes wrong with your blockchain, and it's you have the blue blockchain and you two have the green blockchain. You guys can agree that one of the chains doesn't comply, get rid of it, and use the blockchains that do comply. Again, many eyes make for a safer way of handling information and for 
keeping uh, information that's not uh, compliant out of the system. So blocks of information chained together, put in different locations, that is the essential nature of a blockchain. Most blockchains, when we're talking about that these days, such as the Bitcoin blockchain, are public, meaning that the nodes can go anywhere, and anywhere can, anyone can look at the nodes of the blockchain. They can look at the different blocks. There's no single point of access. They're all over the place, and all you have to know, do is know where they are, and you can take a look at it. It doesn't mean you can get the information in the blocks. That might be encrypted, but you can see the information. So if you go to blockchain.info, for example, you can look at the Bitcoin blockchain all you want. You can see a lot of information about the Bitcoin blockchain. I'm not going to say that information is going to make sense to your average viewer, but you can get hashes for different uh, blockchains. You can see what the previous hash was for a Bitcoin block. You can see what the next hash is. You can see a lot of information about those blocks, including how much blockchain, uh, how much Bitcoin is in there. What you be, but you can't necessarily see who owns it or other, other information about the transaction, that part is encrypted. You don't have the key to get to these Bitcoins. It would be nice to get to the uh, 17,000 Bitcoins there, but that's not part of the public information. That part is the encrypted part that you can't see. But because it's a public blockchain, everyone can look at it. If there's a problem, everyone's going to see it. Some blockchains are private, so we're going to talk about different ways that different industries use blockchains, and some have an interest of not having their information everywhere, not visible to every single person, so they created private blockchains. These are usually used like, say, by financial companies. They are not distributed in the same way, so they're, in some ways they're not as secure because they don't have uh, the same no single point of access that a public blockchain does. But it's good to know that you have these public blockchains, public information that you can see, and private blockchains which are kept by companies to do some of the same functions, but perhaps uh, not quite as secure in terms of um, not being uh, able to be attacked. That said, um, I'll talk a little bit about the security blockchains. So far, they've proven very, very difficult to attack in general. All right, so you may be wondering, why would anyone use it? Well, the financial sector uh, has taken notice. We'll talk about the obvious one and then some other ways that the, the bigger financial sector has responded. Uh, law has taken definite notice of this. I already mentioned smart contracts. I'll also mention a couple of other options as well. Governments are starting to use blockchains or at least investigate them for different uses. There are some uh, aspects of education that could really use blockchains and some educators are starting to use them already. And the possibilities for libraries, particularly law libraries, um, are interesting as well. So next poll. I want to know, have you bought any cryptocurrencies? A, what's a cryptocurrency? B, no, you haven't purchased any. C, yep, you own Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. Uh, D, yeah, and you've made a lot of money. <coughs> Hold on a second. I don't think I cleared the last. Before you answer, I think I forgot to clear the last set. So answer now. A, haven't heard of it. B, no. C, yes, bought a little. D, made a lot of money. All right, no one's admitting to making a lot of money. Poll number? Poll number is 4155. Same as before. I'm just keep clearing it when we're done. So it looks like, um, for most of you, you've heard of it, but you haven't bought any, um, but you kind of know what it is. And no one has made the thousands and thousands of dollars that apparently some have made. Uh, though it's not really a good investment, so I'm glad no one tried. Clearing responses. So let's talk about current cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are online currencies that use a blockchain as its basis for providing information about the transaction. Uh, oddly enough, it kind of goes the other way as well. For most of the blockchains I'm talking about, they actually need sort of a cryptocurrency as its basis just to get started. So they go together, blockchains and cryptocurrencies. The one that everyone has seen the most often is Bitcoin, which recently has risen greatly in value. I think it started out, and it first started out in 2008 at a dollar per Bitcoin, and now it went as far as $3,000 for a Bitcoin uh, just last week, I believe. So it's risen in value really quickly. Um, it's an odd currency in that there's no one in charge of it. That was part of 
what the people who started it wanted to do. They didn't want a central government authority to be behind it. So it could be used for a lot of different kinds of transactions. Some of these transactions are really interesting. For example, if I am living in the United States and work in the United States, but my family works in another country, or lives in another country, such as the Philippines, I may want to give money to the Philippines. If I do that right now using traditional banking methods, what happens to that money when I try to transfer it? What happens? Does anyone know? Okay. What? It's a fee, right? It's a huge fee. It can be 10% or higher. With Bitcoin, if both parties have access to Bitcoin wallets, which is fairly simple, it can be done without a fee. That said, you know, Bitcoin's a little bit difficult for, um, it's, it's difficult technology doesn't mean that necessarily everyone is, is able to navigate it easily. So there are now services that will uh, let people take money, give it to a Bitcoin service, and then they'll, will, the Bitcoin service will deliver the money to someone in another other country, again, for a fee, but much, much less than the fees that banks take. So this becomes a way to provide uh, financial access to resources that weren't available before, or at least not without high fees. So that's one of the benefits that something like Bitcoin provides. Bitcoin, by the way, is just about financial transactions. This blockchain is, here's the money, here's who it went to, this is where it went, how much and when it went, and that is it. There are other blockchains that are becoming, uh, have become more complicated and that can do a lot more. For example, Ethereum. Has anyone heard of Ethereum? What do you know about Ethereum? It's more of a programming system. Yes. But there is a uh, the currency behind it, right? I bought some and it went up in value. Why did it go up in value last week, by the way? It's an ICO. And also, apparently Putin has also gotten into it. So yeah, ICO and Putin seems to be interested in using it as the a virtual currency for Russia. There is a lot of interest in government for... for, for uh, yeah, you want to talk a little about the ICO? Uh, I was just reading about it, actually. It was uh, apparently an EDOS, their own network. So many people are interested in the company that was going to use Ethereum that it brought down their network. Because they, only, they limited it to an hour sale. So, not a lot. Yeah, well, that almost worked. Yeah. But the thing that's really important about it is what you said. In addition to providing a way to exchange money, with Ethereum, you can execute programming. So a lot of companies are either building their own version of Ethereum or using Ethereum to do more than just run financial, uh, basic financial transactions. They can run more complex financial transactions. This is what smart contracts can run on. Or other more complicated transactions that you want to keep track of, uh, that something happened and that you can validate what it is. We'll show you what it is in a moment. So Bitcoin just tracks ownership. Ethereum does a lot more. There are other cryptocurrencies. Ripple.com is like Ethereum. It also, in addition to having its own basic cryptocurrency, it can uh, run programs as well. So that seems to be where those companies that are interested in blockchain are going. They started out with cryptocurrencies. So there's nearly, what, 700 cryptocurrencies out there? A lot of cryptocurrencies. Some are, have other purposes than Bitcoin does. So I believe Dash and Monroe are much more into ensuring the privacy of its users. Bitcoin's not nearly as private as some people think it is, um, as useful a, as a, a currency as it can be. Um, my, one of my favorites is Dogecoin, which is super cute, and I thought it would last for five seconds, but is actually still around. Why? Because don't you trust this little doggy? This is a much more trustworthy type of currency. Uh, and it's actually used for tipping and for charities. So uh, a lot of these cryptocurrencies sort of have their own place. Someone mentioned to me, doesn't someone have pot coin? Yes, I believe that exists. I didn't go and do that kind of research because I wasn't going to get myself in that much trouble. But yeah, there's, there's pretty much a cryptocurrency for any reason you can think of, including the dark side of the internet, the dark web. So does anyone remember what this was from last month? What is this? Wanna cry. What's wanna cry? Ransomware. Ransomware. What's ransomware? It holds all your data ransom so you pay them to get it back and encrypted. Yep. And they, they wanted they're accepting Bitcoin. They very helpfully say right here, if you don't know how to Bitcoin, I have Bitcoin, how to buy Bitcoin, we're gonna tell you all about it. So things like this have given uh, Bitcoin something of a shady reputation and cryptocurrency something of a shady reputation because they can be used by the dark web and are used by the dark web. Like Bitcoin was big in when Silk Road was, was active. I think 
I uh, don't think it's active anymore, but knowing the guys got arrested, but other parts of the dark web still use these cryptocurrencies to transfer money because they are much harder to track. Not impossible, but much harder. Um, that said, as I said before, there are other reasons why people are interested in these cryptocurrencies because they allow people to have access who don't have a bank or who don't want to pay the fees. So um, a shady reputation as it has, it also has other more benevolent possibilities as well. And the blockchain itself has lots of possibilities that people are starting to get interested in. Um, people always want to know where to buy. Uh, I bought mine from Coinbase. I thought they took a bit of a, a hefty fee, but it was very easy to buy from Coinbase, and that seems to be where I was, look, when I was looking for at people who were recommending where do you buy it, the one that was most consistently referred to. So I bought $20 of Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, $10 each. And within a few days, they'd gone up in price by $23. Yesterday, it was $21. Now it's $25. You can see it's not a great investment. It's too volatile. Um, I think a couple of you said you bought Bitcoin. Who bought Bitcoin? Or some other cryptocurrency? Or anyone ha other have, pl have a place that they would recommend they buy it? Because that one's hard to say. Other places that people seem to like are Bitpanda and Kraken. Uh, and there's, uh, those are U.S. exchanges. There are non-U.S. exchanges if you're not using uh, dollars. But I could not get a lot of information about what was reliable or what provided the most fair fees. What do you think? Wasn't there, I, I, I'd read an article that there was a problem with some of these exchanges in the, in the fact that your Bitcoin's tied to them and then these exchanges just up and disappear. They get up and disappear. They, they can be hacked. So, um, one, we'll talk, I'll continually talk about security. The blockchain itself tends to be fairly secure, but the exchanges themselves aren't always secure. So what someone happens with the exchanges is they can't not just up and disappear, but someone hacks into them and then they find a way to take your money um, the blockchain is still secure, but they managed to get into the back end of the exchange and get your money. So, and then you can't get it back because it's gone and not regulated. Um, but if you need to buy it at any point, <coughs> Coinbase seems to be the most reputable place that I know of right now. Other financial institutions are taking interest in the blockchain beyond just the cryptocurrencies. There's a lot that this blockchain can do. You can see what it does really well is it's tracking information in a way that's very hard to change. So they're using block, private blockchains, which I mentioned before, that's the, within the company itself. Often those blockchains are permissioned, meaning that unlike that Bitcoin blockchain where all of us can take a look at it, in a private blockchain perhaps just, oh, you and I, Kristen, you and I can look at it, no one else. So that's it. We can keep it secure. Because what we are producing perhaps is a secure ledger. So let's say I have a financial transaction and I want to keep details on it from point A to point B to point C to point D and say that at each time this thing happened in such a way that all parties can see it and agree on it, that's where the blockchain comes in. So even if something like a mortgage, okay, someone's applied, it's been approved, uh, it's been distributed, this is what, how the payments are being made, you could keep that information in a blockchain that everyone can look at and it can't be changed and can't, and for the most part, cannot be hacked. IP has started to take notice of this because enforcing digital rights management isn't always easy. So I've seen everything from a comic book company that says they're going to release its comics on a blockchain, okay, meaning only people who have access to the blockchain can get it, to music seems to be where it's taking off right now. And I've seen two versions of this so far. One, uh, there is a company that I've written about for the Spectrum article, so you'll see more there where what they are doing is creating the technology behind distributing music files. So what that lets them do is um, lets it sell it to other companies and say, okay, now we'll have DRM. Only people with access to the blockchain will have access to those files. They can't be pirated in the same way that files can be pirated now. Because remember, the blockchain can hold anything, including files. So. Then if, if you have access to it, you've got the key. You have access to it, you're great. If not, you can't get to it. The second way I've seen it is someone's developing a music cooperative. So that's a blockchain that many people can join, and then many people can have access to some or all the music in there. And I thought that was really interesting because that takes advantage of, of the democratic nature of blockchains to let people have access to music. And it's not about limiting access, it's about getting access to those who want to join the cooperative and believe in the principles of the cooperative. So I was like, well, that's another interesting way. That's not really possible with other kinds of technologies. 
Has anyone else heard of different ways of using IP and blockchain? So that's one thing to watch out for. What about elsewhere in the law? So this is where we get into our smart contracts, which then leads to smart wills and smart real estate. Let's start with smart contracts. Who's heard of smart contracts before? Raise your hands again. What's a smart contract? It has those uh, uses that blockchain all that to be able to verify that a certain thing has happened and then the next thing happens. So it's a self-executing contract. So let's say you and I agree I'm going to buy something from you and then you're going to provide me uh, the thing after I pay you money. And as the blockchain verifies that each thing happens, then the next step takes place. So that way it keeps an intermediary out. This is an odd thing for common law uh, legal systems like ours, which are used to having an intermediary be sort of responsible for these contracts. Usually if our contract goes bad, we might go to a court. But these contracts are meant to execute themselves and are not meant to have this kind of intermediary. Uh, they're just meant to go step one, step two, step three, step four. Let's take a look. So, widget company agrees to sell Acme Company 100 widgets for $1,000 and then ship them one week after payment. That's the contract. It's built into the blockchain. And if I've got a blockchain like Ethereum, I can use coding, or I can work, if I'm a lawyer, I can work with a coder to encode this contract into the blockchain so that each step happens. Then as each step happens, I can re uh, record each step in the blockchain and as verified. So widget produces the 100 widgets. Great. Notice that hash connects to hat hash. We're starting to build the chain of the blockchain. Great. Then Acme pays the $1,000. And again, the two hashes are connected. 0016, 0016. We can start to see this is valid. And I can't go back and change something because it's built into the chain. And as we saw before, if you change the information, you break the hash. Widget ships the widgets, also encoded. And finally, Acme receives the widgets. Great. The whole contract is executed and done and encoded in the blockchain. Everybody's satisfied. Everybody knows that things took place. And everybody has access to this. Both parties have access to this and see, can see contract happened, self-executed, no problems. You can even add to this contract um, an online dispute resolution system. Has anyone heard of those before? Online dispute resolution system. Anyone have to deal with eBay where something goes wrong? And it sort of seems to happen automatically what eBay does. They use an online dispute resolution system. You could build that into this kind of contract. So let's say that instead of shipping it a week after uh, payment was received, they shipped it two weeks. And we built in the contract, if that happens, then Acme is going to receive a refund of 1%. That can be automatically encoded. So with the timestamps, this basic uh, blockchain doesn't have timestamps, but the timestamp said, the shipping happened two weeks later, then the contract can automatically then provide the 1% refund. So you can add this to a self-executing contract. Um, there are a lot of great possibilities here in terms of contracts that don't need mediation, contracts that take care of themselves, things that are automatically verified, and there's a lot of frightening possibilities. Contracts tend to be more complicated than the one I just showed you there, and therefore can be complicated to code. So as we're learning about this, it could take a little while to make this work. That said, there are law firms that are already working on this. I'll post some examples um, when I get a chance to post at the end of law firms. I think like, to, uh, oh man, one begins with a D that now it's gone out of my head. Um, and others are interested in this. Yep. Yep. So I'm, I'm trying to think about how this would be a different type of transaction than, than a, a not very smart contract. So it, for example, this has never happened to any of us, I'm sure, but somebody said, man, I shipped that. I shipped it a week ago, you know? Um, is there a way to, to add lies into the, into the system such that, you know, they said they shipped the widget, they gave you theoretical proof of shipment, but in fact there was no shipment, and so now you've got a blockchain that actually has a lie embedded. So that could be part of the problem is it could have a lie embedded. Now, the idea for a smart contract is it's supposed to have something that both sides agree is verified. So if they, you know, if, if they provided the proof and you've already agreed that that's the proof, that's when we get, and that's where you can get some of the trouble, where this executes it 
one after another and then doesn't take in, uh, account of the fact that maybe someone lied or fudged something but managed to get the information in anyway. It's supposed to be designed so you can't get bad information about shipping in there because it's supposed to be something that's verifiable that everyone can go and look and say, yep, that happened. I, don't see the sh I tested the shipping number and it didn't work. Um, no, it's supposed to be a shipping number and whatever FedEx says, we're going with it. So, anything else? Cool. So this then gets to the idea of smart wills, which can be executed, say, without probate. And this is another thing I've seen people start to explore. So, uh, and the idea here is often wills include things that are verifiable but happen long after the demise of the person who wrote the will. So let's say... Um, Joshua has two kids, Billy and Bobby, and he says, okay, when I die, um, whoever marries first is going to get an additional $1,000 for the wedding. So, you know, it could be 15 when, uh, and 14 when uh, Joshua dies, but they get married when they're 23. So if Billy gets married when they're 23, that's a verifiable thing that happens, and then a smart will can self-execute it without having to go to probate or to some other party. So some law firms are starting to look in the possibility of adding these kinds of, using blockchain to create these kinds of wills that are self-executing, particularly with things that happen long after. The other big interest I see is in self-executing real estate. Who here has bought and sold the house? A lot of us. And it gets complicated, right? <coughs> Why is there so much complexity when buying and selling real estate? What are some of the issues there? Transfer. Transfer. Gets the money to get so what is it that we're not, that, that, that we, that's lacking between you and I in a, a real estate thing that we it's trust? It's fiduciary. Yes. Both fiduciary. Someone said trust. Who said that? Trust. So one of the things, so we're not trusting each other. We're not, we don't know who's responsible. Exactly. <laughs> so money is involved. Money is involved. So one of the things that blockchain is supposed to do, and we see this in Bitcoin, for example, is I don't have to trust you if I'm working with Bitcoin to say I've given you the Bitcoin, you know you've got it, because the blockchain takes care of that trust. With a technology that can take care of that trust, then we don't necessarily need all those uh, third parties. If I can verify that I have the income and the intention through whatever method it is that, that we both decide, um, that it's going, that, that this real estate transaction is going to go forward. Maybe we don't need escrow. Or when we're working with closing documents, maybe we don't need the giant pile of closing documents. Maybe that can be made simplified because it's in a standardized blockchain. So this is one of the things I've seen people write about and be interested in, okay, maybe this can make real estate easier by getting away some of the third parties. What's going to happen then, though? Who's going to be unhappy about this? The brokers and the third parties. <laughs> So um, keep an eye on this. So this might be one of those things that's a solution in, look of, uh, in, in search of a problem. Could solve a lot of problems, but there's a, already some systems in place that seem to be working fairly well for us, but not always. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So is blockchain legal? And that, what I mean by that is are governments uh, responding to blockchain, and are they doing about that, anything about it? Does anyone know about one government that, state government that recently said, yes, blockchains are legal and you can use them for evidence and signatures? Arizona, where we are now. Uh, just this spring, passed a law that said that. They also passed a law that said you cannot track firearms information in blockchains, like who fired it or who owns it. For some reason, that had to be added to that law or as in sequence with that law. So you can track evidence and you can track um, other kinds of legal documents, but not information about firearms through blockchains. That, that's a specific law. I'm not sure why, but it is. Um, what, I, what I'm talking to today was inspired by a presentation at the ABA Tech Show given by Oliver Goodenough, uh, a legal professor who's very interested in different technologies, and he talked a lot about blockchain there, and I found it fascinating, so I wanted to know more. And he has helped write a law for Vermont that says much what the, um, the Arizona law says. It just hasn't I think it's passed both the House and Senate, but I don't think it's been signed yet, or it's still going back and forth between the House and Senate. But that would probably be the next state to respond to it. So we're starting to see states take uh, notice of this. In the United States, um, the United States government has a bipartisan blockchain commission that's looking into it. The European Union has a commission that's looking into it. So a lot of people are starting to look into it if they don't have actual laws yet about the legalities of blockchain. But the big thing that people are interested in, back to real estate, 
comes to titles, real estate titles. What's the big problem with real estate titles? Someone said something? Whether they're clear. Whether they're clear. So, so who here had to buy title insurance to show that it's uh, legitimate or not? Particularly in countries which may have had um, civil troubles or other issues, um, it's not always clear who has what title, so those countries are starting to do something about it. Do you know, anyone know what the first country it is that's actually starting to put real estate transaction into blockchain? The Republic of Georgia now keeps track of real estate uh, transactions in blockchain. It started out by taking, doing official government ones, and my understanding this has now moved to uh, other kinds of real estate uh, transactions as well. Honduras is now looking into this as well. I see this in many uh, articles saying that this is probably going to be the next country that then puts its titles in. Because there is a lot of real estate and other financial assets that are out there that are officially titled or officially connected to somebody. And people are looking into blockchain as a way to do that. I can see some good and bad aspects of it. One, if I have the title for something, what can I do with it? Buy, sell, and mortgage it, right? I can get lots of money. But I can also see someone taking advantage of this. Oh, you have, the you, you have a title, I'm going to strongly pressure you to sell because I have more money than you. So it could be, has some interesting repercussions. And my favorite place that's looking into this, where for some reason titles are shakier than I should, who here's from the Chicago area? <laughs> Cook County is also looking into this. So soon in Cook County we may have blockchain titles there as well. Education. Um, so we're looking into tracking credentials. Where's this building at? Anyone recognize it? What would be the one education institution that's already using blockchain to, uh, to track credentials? Is that here MIT? Yeah. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Yeah, that's the building that always has a car on top of it after prank day. Um, so Massachusetts Institute of Technology is providing some credentialing through blockchains. Why would that be useful? You can put it on your resume. So anyone here ever had to ask for your own transcript of proof of graduation from some institution and it was much harder than it should have been? Isn't that your information, Vicki? Yes. Why don't you have access to it? I want to know. Exactly. <laughs> why, so, Debbie, why? Why? But blockchain, if you could get it in a blockchain, you would have access to it and it would be verifiable. Your, the institution would have access to it. If the institution went away, the blockchain would still be there. You would still have access to it. You wouldn't have to worry. Um, it's not something anyone can change. Everyone would agree. Yep, you have those credentials. It's not something that you could lie on a resume. The other thing that we're seeing happening is uh, I'm sure most of us have more than one degree. So you may need to get from different institutions. And some of us may have gotten our degree from more than one institution. You may have taken a class here or a class there. And I think we're going to see more students take their classes at different institutions. So they can put their credentials in a blockchain and have access to it. So... Something that, you know, it would be great if some law schools could be on the forefront uh, of there with uh, Massachusetts and Institute of Technology providing some of these credentials on the blockchain. So, let's get at it. Who's, who's volunteering first? All right, not yet. Okay. Libraries, um, let's see if we're tracking information. I thought one person said, yeah, we could track circulation records this way. Does that seem like a great idea? No. No. <laughs> it's like, no, that's a... That's a, that's a solution in search of a problem. What about archives, though? Do you think blockchain is going to be useful for archives? Yeah. You could track provenance of things through this. Remember, this is about tracking things from one thing to another. So if you had a blockchain for an archive, oh uh, yeah, I legitimately own this thing that's in my archives. I can prove it with the blockchain. And then there's my favorite thing that I think blockchain can do, or I'm hoping, and I know people are starting to look into this, and I'm hoping it can happen. All right, librarian, law librarians, raise your hands. What's one of the biggest issues affecting us each day when, when we are dealing with primary source documents? Authenticity. So, blockchains could provide the basis for authenticity. Now, I know uh, the people who are in charge of, I always get this wrong, Ulema? Uh, uh, and sometimes I say Ulema, and everyone's like, what are you talking about? The other thing. Um, so, are looking into this, I know from personal experience that each state has its own way of producing documents that are authentic. 
That's not a problem blockchain can solve, but blockchain can solve the problem of this document is authentic. Because right now when you see this particular um, grainy uh, logo, where do you see it? What kind of document? Federal, but what, what's it on? What's the format? It's a PDF. It's a PDF, not anything else. But with blockchain, it can authenticate any file type. So you don't have to be limited to just PDFs, which has its own proprietary issues. So what I'm hoping is we can use this for some kind of, for some states will start to look at it for authentication. I think some are, but it may be a while before they get there. Maybe Arizona will be first, because they've already said blockchains are legal. So hopefully, once people say this is authentic, those of us who live in Illinois know that certain things are not authentic, like our entire regulatory code. We have no <laughs> authentic version of this. Great, just take the website, throw it through blockchain, you should be great. But how easy is it to throw something through a blockchain? I can do a demo. And at this place, Anders.com, there's a great film, it's about 17 minutes long, that walks through the basics of blockchain. And now I'll walk you through a quick demo of what, we, what this can do. So this is an empty blockchain. There's nothing in it. There's no content. But I can copy, let's say, the preamble of the Constitution, like I did before. And then I paste it in. It's produced a hash. But what's wrong with this hash? What did I say it has to have before? Zero, zero, zero. zero. So one of the things I haven't talked about yet is mining. And mining is the process of producing that hash so that it's a legitimate hash. So when I click mine, it's going to run some calculation I don't quite understand yet behind the scenes and come up with a hash that's 000, zero, zero based on its own uh, algorithm. So I hit mine. I go, no, nope, this is all wrong. It's all wrong down the line. I hit mine. And within some amount of time, it will come up with 000. zero, zero. That time is sort of random. Again, someone says this takes a lot of resources. And this is part of what takes a lot of resources, producing this hash so that it is legitimate. So you've heard of mining for Bitcoin. It used to be that you could use a mining Bitcoin with that computer you have there. Now to do it, it requires increasingly more complicated um, computers to create the hashes that Bitcoin uses to create what Bitcoin uses to create another Bitcoin. And so people buy very expensive $5,000 computer setups and hoping to find the next Bitcoin. Um, but here in this hat, on this particular um, blockchain, it's pretty easy. It only takes a few seconds. So I'll copy and paste the next bit. And I hit mine again. And it produces a legitimate hash. And see, it takes a little longer because it's doing more complicated uh, thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean each block gets more complicated. It just has to do with what it's producing right now. Because when I copy this section, it's going to go pretty quickly. So I hit mine, and there it became instant because, for some reason, that calculation was easier. And I can keep doing that and creating a chain. If you want to play with this yourself, just go to Anders.com. You can watch the video. You can play with hashes. You can play with blocks. Here we're playing with a blockchain. You can see what a distributed chain looks like, uh, or even what a Coinbase might look like. So you can sit there and play with yourself. And I find that was the easiest way to sort of understand how the process works. Um, you can also download an experiment with a NIST browser, which is what Ethereum runs on. Um, though I did try to download it, and it took so long to build the back end of the browser that I didn't have time to play with it. It took like two or three hours to, the download was fast, but then it had to set up its own, own sort of blockchain system, and that took quite a while. So it's a little more realistic, but there are many other places to play, and I'll try, uh, the, one of the best books I found that, ah, there we go provides a lot of different ways to play with blockchain is there is, in fact, a blockchain for dummies books. That's what it says under my ILL thing here. Um, and this came out in 2017, and it does have information, step-by-step -step information on how you can play with blockchain yourself. And it says, this is good if you are super techie, and this is good if you're not super techie. Um, so it's been sort of fun to play with some of the stuff uh, in the book and on the web. So it's another great place to start. There are a lot of places you can build your own. Some, like wallet builders, do cost if you want to try, if 
not a lot that you have to pay. Others involve things like, oh, downloading things from GitHub. And uh, I run a Mac, so once I like, you know, unzipped it, there wasn't much I could do with it because I didn't have servers. But if you happen to have a lot of servers available to you, or you want to run things from command lines, try any of these things, and you can have fun with them. There are bigger players in this as well. So, go away. All right. Well, exit this thing here. No, not exit the whole thing. All right, that's just going to be here for no apparent reason. All right, so Microsoft has gone, Microsoft was, was Azure, and IBM has gone into with IBM Watson. So uh, both are offering blockchain as service type platforms to do all kinds of things for companies. Um, and I've also seen, when we're, we talk about the big uh, players, they're often doing it to track assets in real life. So I think one of you mentioned bananas. Someone mentioned bananas to me as something that someone could track any banana. Uh, more realistic example that someone gave me was, let's say we want to track ethical diamonds. So I want to know this diamond I'm buying is an ethical diamond. So the blockchain ledger using one of these systems might say, all right, this we can verify that this diamond came from this particular mine, and it's an ethical mine. It has this size, it has this carat, it has this weight, uh, it has a serial number, it went to this wholesaler, it was sold by this retailer, this person owns it, and now you own it. And all this is tracked by the blockchain, so I can keep track of what's going on. So there's a lot of things like uh, this hyperledger that are meant for keeping track of really minute information about commerce. And we're already starting to see that happen because that is something that people need solved. They do need to track things from one place to another um, really accurately in a, ver in a way that can be verified. So we're seeing blockchain used for that. But what's another thing that I'm uh, sort of hinting at on my slide here that now gets added when the companies like uh, Microsoft and IBM get involved with blockchain? Validation. Not validation. What do we know about Cortana and Watson? What are they about? Watson in particular. AI. And I really have no idea what that's going to be about, but people seem to be very excited about it. It's like blockchain plus AI. Hmm. Um, so really intelligent neural network type blockchains. Are we heading towards Skynet? Probably not. All right. So let's get back to the basics of blockchain. Some of the pros. It's secure. I have, in my reading, I have not found anyone who's been able to hack a blockchain itself. It doesn't mean they can't hack the things around a blockchain, companies around a blockchain, or do social hacking. Um, the blockchain itself seems to be very secure because of the way it's hashed. Um, if for public blockchains, information is trackable. When we spend bitcoins, we can see what's happened. It's visible. It makes it democratic. The information is immutable, meaning once I add a block, that block is there. I can say there's a new block that represents new information, but the previous block is hard to change. The only way we can change the block is if all the 51% of the people who um, have access to the information on the blockchain all agree to change it, um, So, which doesn't happen that often. It's flexible. We saw many different uses from blockchain, from transactions to contracts to wills to IP. Um, there are many open blockchains out there that people can download and experiment with, so lots of open source technologies. And the thing about blockchain, unlike, say, standard AI, is it uses technology that's available now. The reason why it's become a big deal lately is because the technology is cheaper. So it's much easier to do these nodes and distribute them, even if it involves a certain level of computing. Um, that computing is just basic um, encryption computing. It's not something that's difficult or requires new ways of thinking or new technologies unlike AI, where we keep talking about new neural networks um, and other forms of artificial intelligence. So brace yourselves, blockchain is coming. Cons. It is resource intensive. Uh, in order, we, we have lots of nodes. But how big is the Bitcoin blockchain right now? Does anyone know? It's like many, many gigabytes. Someone said, uh, my reading said, if I wanted to, you can download the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin blockchain. You can put it on your computer and just to have it with you. It doesn't mean you can access the Bitcoins, but you can have the blockchain. It would take you days to download. It's not intuitive. I'm still struggling with some of the basics of blockchain, so if you still, even after this talk, are still trying to think like, wait, I kind of get it, but I don't quite get everything, that's part of the issue here is it's not always clear as to what the next step is, and that makes it hard to implement. Um, it has a reputation, as we talked about, as being part of the dark part of the web. The bad guys use blockchain, therefore the good guys shouldn't use it. 
And as you and I were talking about at the beginning, it's not necessarily more efficient than things we have now. Um, this poor dog's going to tell you all about it. Your blockchain isn't more efficient than its traditional methods, and so now we're all sad. Um, and we don't know, blockchain's only been around in active since, what, Bitcoin started 2008, right? That's less than 10 years ago. So that's not a long time for us to find out what can go wrong with the technology. So we don't know what all the problems with blockchain might be because maybe we haven't seen them yet. Anyone else have any pros and cons I may have forgotten? Let's talk about the future. All right, so what are the things that blockchain's not doing yet that it could do? Passwords, are they the best thing in the world? <coughs> No. No. Um, yeah, check that thing. Absolutely not. Um, so people are talking about using blockchain for ID management. One of the great things is like it says, I got a private key. I have access to it. Other people don't. And the other thing is, who likes going to like a bar and showing someone their driver's license that has way more information than you actually want to share, or other kinds? So. Yeah, blockchain provides a way that maybe you could just share the information someone needs to know and not the information they don't need to. I've talked about asset tracking before, and that seems to be what a lot of people are interested in, from diamonds to bananas. Walmart is using this. Uh, this could be a way to secure the Internet of Things. So a lot of people are investigating ways to make um, the, all these devices we have that connect to the Internet more secure using blockchain, which then could provide some interesting questions about discovery, but that's for another day. I've talked about financial access, particularly when it comes to cryptocurrencies. As they become more reputable, they will give people more access to uh, finances and financial resources than are available now through traditional banking systems. And hopefully even access to things like their own companies, uh, with something that proves they own it, and their own real estate. Uh, and finally, you might use blockchain to track your own reputation. We keep talking about the idea of resume and being able to show people what we want them to know. So building beyond those education credentials, we can put other things on a blockchain that are verifiable, that we can prove, that then help us establish our reputation and share that with others. So I'm hoping that we may see some aspect of that in the future. Again, with interesting uh, legal uh, implications, uh, when it comes to things like evidence and being witnesses. So my last question for you in the poll, um, 4155, is are you teaching blockchain? Yes, just the basics. Yeah, and we're actually talking a lot about blockchain, not expecting that. No, but you're thinking maybe it's time to add it. Or no, you're not quite thinks, uh, convinced that now is the right time. So... All right, a lot of you have answered. I am starting to mention blockchain and have been for a little while just as a term that students might hear about. Like, all right, I'm going to introduce you to basic concepts like security, but be aware that there are also these advanced concepts like blockchain. And so if you hear it, pay attention to it. One of you says they're teaching blockchain. A couple of you say you're teaching blockchain. Who is teaching blockchain and what are you teaching? I, at the time, in advanced legal research, I basically just to them what it was so that they would have a clue. <coughs> so just the basics. Yeah. So one of you says you're teaching at a high level. Who's doing that? No, they want me to talk to you about it. All right, who are the naysayers and why won't you teach it right now? I'll give you one. Okay. I am fascinated. Um, I wouldn't teach it right now for two reasons. One, I don't think I understand enough and have enough information to either answer questions or give people good resources to, to, to explore on their own. And two, in the university where I am, there is so little time devoted to things like can you find pending legislation that, that to me, I, I'm much more interested in having somebody go out and be able to find you know a bill that's that's potentially coming to fruition and impacting their client than teaching about this. Though I think probably I will actually say the words after I've done some more reading. Sure. So that, that's why I'm dealing I'll with... I'll plenty of reading. Yeah, no, I'm dealing with a student population who has some other really fundamental needs. Right. I have brought this up to, you know, various people, and like, I brought it to like, one of our labor law faculty who also teaches contracts. And he is not like Mr. Technology, but he said, wait a minute. Could it solve this one problem we have in labor law where people uh, create information that they then can't verify later? Yes, yes it can. All right, maybe this is something we want to talk about. I might at this point recommend that 
a contract staff just mention it, just like Chris, uh, Chris said, just so people can know that it's there. And because my worry is, we are starting to see a lot of law firms take advantage of it, and we don't want to put our law students at a disadvantage by not knowing about it. Who plans to teach it, and what would you like your students to know? Not sure, not sure yet? All right, well, you've got some time to think about it. I hope that you found this information useful. Um, and uh, we're out of time, but you can come up to me now.